Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Justin Coulson and with me is Dr. Christy Goodwin and thanks to Parenting SA, we're speaking in this webcast about children and screens adapting to the new reality. And when we say new reality, we mean pandemic parenting. We mean children being at home and doing a lot of learning via screens and, and just the, the reality that we're not able to be out and about and living the lives that we're used to living or were at least before coronavirus COVID-19. There's a handful of housekeeping items to dive into before we kick off the webcast properly. And Dr. Goodwin will, uh, do you mind if I call you Christy? Is that okay? Much better. Fantastic. Uh, I'm Justin, by the way. I'm, I'm much happier with Justin and Dr. Coulson as well. Uh, Christy will get us going with some of the content, uh, but, but just a couple of things to help you to navigate the webcast if you're participating live. If you're watching a replay, of course, much of this won't apply, so I'll make sure that I whiz through it fairly quickly. The first is that if you're watching live, you've got a couple of buttons to choose from in terms of the way you communicate with us as we present. The first is that there's a Q and A. If you have questions, we encourage you to use the Q and A. There's also a chat function. The chat function is for you to just throw out little remarks, um, you know, say, yep, that's me, or I'm, you know, I, I disagree and here's why. This, this is an opportunity for you to just engage with us quickly. So if you could please use the Q&A specifically for questions that you have, we will answer those questions as the webcast wraps up. And if you can use the chat for, for fun banter, uh, objections, agreement, and, and anything that we might engage you with via chat as we go through the webcast. There's a third button for raising your hand. Please don't raise your hand. We're not gonna be coming to you if you raise your hand when we just can't really manage that with more than 1600 people who have signed up to be part of this webcast tonight. The webcast is supposed to go for around 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, we're gonna do our best to adhere to that, but we also recognize that this is one of those subjects that we can really get carried away with and talk a lot about. Both Christy and I are very, very uh, excited about the topic. Uh, and we know that with your questions, there's gonna be a lot of, well, a, a lot of enthusiasm around some of the things we talk about. So we'll do our best to keep to time. We know that you've got big kids looking after little kids. You've got kids staring at screens right now so that you can be here. And we wanna be respect, respectful of your time. And I think that's probably about it for housekeeping. Christy, is there anything else that you want to add or should we just dive straight over to you? I think let's dive in. Okay, oh, there is one more thing. I just thought of it. Uh, because of the way we're running this Zoom webcast, I'm actually pushing the buttons at my end to change the slides. And so every now and again, Christy might need to say something like, uh, <clears throat> next slide please, Justin. At which point I'll go like this. Oh no, I'll go like this and we'll be away. So question number one, oh, oh. And sorry, there's one more thing. I can't help myself. I'm so sorry. We've decided as we took all of the feedback from all of the questions that you sent through before we even dived into building this webcast, that we wanted to build a presentation that addressed the most popular, common, difficult questions that you're asking. And so we've, we've essentially narrowed it down to three main areas. And we're going to answer those questions tonight, starting with how much screen time is enough. And Christy, I'm going to hand over to you to get us started here. Thank you, Justin. And can I also commend you um, for either bribing, coercing, um, or tricking somebody else to navigate bedtime with your children so you can be here watching the live webinar, um, or perhaps you are trying to watch the replay. Um, I think the fact that you have taken this time to learn more about raising screen ages speaks volumes about your investment in your parenting. So well done. Um, I um, speak to parents throughout the country and the universal dilemma that parents ask is the question pertaining to how much screen time is healthy or appropriate for their child. And it is understandable that we ask this question. Um, most of us find raising screen just confusing and concerning. And one of the reasons is because as parents who've been into this digital landscape, we've got no frame of reference. For most of us, we had predominantly analog childhoods. We stared at the sky and not at a screen. But today, children are spending increasing amounts of time with digital devices. In fact, an Australian study last year told us that by the time the average Australian child celebrates their eighth birthday, they will have spent the equivalent of almost one full year of their life with digital technologies. That is just a profound amount of time. So I think as parents, it is natural for us to worry and fret about how much time they're spending online. Um, we recently surveyed adolescent girls and asked them about a range of their digital behaviours. And one of the questions we asked them, would they rather have a broken bone or a broken phone? And you know what 85% of the female respondents said. The thought of being digitally disconnected is akin um, to 
um, digitally amputating them. So one of the questions is regarding how much time. And the reason that this is difficult to answer is because um, we need to consider more than just how much time. Time is not the only metric. Um, we need to be having more nuanced conversations. Um, it is really difficult to prescribe an exact amount of time. Now, we do have government guidelines here in Australia um, that pr prescribe or recommend um, appropriate amounts of time, but this is really hard to enforce because all children have different tipping points. You might have an eight-year-old who can spend an hour on a digital device and then they digitally disconnect and they're fine, but you could also have an eight-year-old who spends the equivalent amount of time and they come off and they throw what we call often a, a techno tantrum. And so all kids have different tipping points. So time is important, especially if it's displacing your child's developmental needs. So rather than giving you an exact amount of time based on your child's age, what I suggest parents do is consider the opportunity cost. What are screens displacing? If your child's time online is at the expense of their basic developmental priorities, then yes, then perhaps it is too much time online. We need to check that their screen time isn't displacing their fundamental basic physiological and psychological needs. Are they getting enough physical movement? Are they getting adequate sleep? Um, are they playing? Are they having real social connections when we're not socially isolated? Um, but real connections and developing relationships. If you can answer yes to those questions, then we can use screens and not have to fret about their online time derailing their development. So I think the better question to ask is not only what is their tech time displacing, but as the next slide will tell us, um, we need to also focus. And I think the better question we can ask is not, not just how much time they're spending online, but a better question to ask these days is what are they doing? Is it active? Is it passive? Is it leisure? Is it learning? Is the app or the website or the multiplayer video game that they're using age appropriate? During this health pandemic, I encourage parents when it comes to screen time um, to control the controllables. And you may not be able to strictly adhere to your screen time limits that you once had, often because they need to use devices now for both learning and leisure. These devices that um, have become, um, you know, saturated in our digital lives are your child's portal to both leisure and learning. So what I think we're better off doing as parents is to focus on looking at what they are doing. Now, I can give you a list of recommended apps and websites, but unfortunately, that list will become outdated very quickly. And so what I encourage parents to do is to know the digital playgrounds, know the places and spaces where your children are gravitating online, and look at um, finding good quality content. My three go-to resources that I encourage parents to look, for, uh, look at when considering appropriate apps is Common Sense Media, who review apps, websites, video games, etc. Um, our Australian eSafety Commissioner site and the Australian Council on Children and um, the Media. Now, Justin's going to delve, in this to, in, delve into this a little bit more, in more detail, but we really want to focus more on our kids using technology to create and connect than we want them to use it as a tool for just consumption. Now, that's not to say they should never watch YouTube or should never just consume content on social media, but in an ideal world, we want them spending more of their time online being active as opposed to being passive. So the next point... Um, that I have got in terms of controlling what you can, what's within your locus control when it comes to screen time, is I encourage parents to be the pilot and not the passenger of the digital plane. And as the pilot of the digital plane, you need to set boundaries with your children. Don't go in and present them with a screen time contract or enforce a, a, um, some boundaries on them. With their involvement, get your children and your teens to come up with boundaries around when and where they can use technology. Now, when it comes to when they use technology, be really careful about bookending your day with technology. So try to discourage them from using it very first thing upon waking up. And the reason is, this also applies to us as well, when we gravitate towards the screen in the morning, we often activate our limbic system. And so we can pick up the phone or we can reach for the gaming console. And what we do is activate the stress response. Our limbic system helps regulate our emotional 
emotional state. And so your daughter only needs to pick up her device and see one unkind message. Your son can start to play a rapid fire, fast paced game and it can induce this stressed state. Equally, at the end of the day, when they're using screens before they go to sleep, it can have really negative impacts, not only on the amount of sleep, but also the quality of the sleep. We know that if children are using blue light devices before they go to sleep, um, they often don't get the deep REM sleep, um, which is when they sleep and form memories. So really important that we moderate their use both before and after, uh, before and at the end of the day. The other time um, boundary that I think parents really can control is not only when, but where. Where are the no-go tech places in your house? And I strongly discourage bedrooms. Um, I'm going to share an unfortunate story with you that happened to a, a girl in Sydney a couple of years ago. She was in her bedroom late at night and she started to get a, a WhatsApp message um, from her boy, a boy that she was familiar with. And the conversation was very vanilla to begin with until this boy started to demand that this girl um, send nude photos. Now she told him to leave her alone, but he persisted and persisted until she decided to send a photo of her breasts without her head in the photo, but her breasts to this boy to stop him from um, badgering her. Now this boy disseminated her photo on a range of platforms and this had really dire consequences for this girl. The problem was um, many uh, in this particular situation but one of them was that she had access at night. We know that about 87% of cyberbullying takes place at night because at night time, not only do children often have unsupervised access, but at night, they're part of their brain, their prefrontal cortex that helps make sensible decisions. It's their executive control center of the brain. Um, it helps them to manage their impulses and it helps with their memory. Well, this part of the brain is depleted. It's exhausted. And instead, the part of the brain called the amygdala, which is the emotional hub of the brain, it up at night. Now this is a diabolical combination when children have access to devices at night unsupervised. Their logical brain is, is turned off and their emotional brain is turned on. This girl was so terrified about upsetting this boy that she thought she would pacify him by sending a photo. So again, um, I share that story to remind you that we need to set up um, the boundaries that we can control. So I think obsessing less over the amount of time, um, consider time in terms of their developmental needs, but also consider what you can control. And I think the better things that you can focus on is looking at what they're doing and also when and where. It's really interesting. Now, what I'd love, if you don't mind folks, if you could jump into the chat, just give us an idea of how old your children are. Uh, in fact, if you could just say you've got primary school or high school kids, that would be easier for us to monitor. If you can jump into the chat and help us to know that, because to some extent that will affect what we pitch to you in terms of content and the way we are able to help you. Uh, it looks like most of the things that are coming through a primary school, there's a few high schools, but it seems to be primarily the lower grades. I'm watching five, seven, loads of primary, four and two. Okay, so we're still going to address some of the bigger issues like the story that uh, Christy has shared. I think that that's vitally important that we help you to know that. And, and it's obvious watching this that there are many of you with children in both and some of you who have got a couple of high schoolers as well. But thank you for about the uh, 700 messages that just came through. Um, the, the whole idea of how much screen time has always bothered me. And for the last 10 years, whenever parents have asked me that, I've said, no, it's not about how much, it's about what kind. And late last year, a researcher that I admire tremendously, he's a bit of a controversial fellow. His name's Andrew Shabulski. He is based at Oxford. And he wrote this great piece where he said, it's not, it's not a sensible question to ask how much. You don't sit down at the table with your kids and say, all right, kids, how much food time have you had today? Mm -hmm. You say, tell me about what you've eaten today. And our children, as they're using their devices, are participating in what we might call a digital diet. This is not a new idea. The whole idea of a digital diet has been around for, for a long time now. And we're, we've kind of, in the same way that we consider what the digital, oh, sorry, what, the, what the, the nutritional diet is that our children are ingesting, we also want to consider what their digital diet is. Are they snacking on digital junk food all day, the equivalent of digital fairy floss, or are they getting stuck into some really hearty stuff, maybe some 
I don't know. Let's let's go all paleo Pete. He's been in the news. Actually, let's not. He's been in the news a little bit too much lately. But you know, what 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 are they actually getting into? I guess what I'm highlighting here is the content matters. In fact, there are five C's that I'm going to address just briefly. Christy's already mentioned three of them, but I just want to emphasize them again. There are five C's, maybe even six C's that should really drive the decisions that we're making around screens. And you'll note that the amount of time is almost irrelevant. Now, it's not totally irrelevant. Some good data that's been collected over the last half a dozen years or so from very large scale studies in the United States shows that when our children are experiencing more than, well, well we're calling it a very high volume of screen time. So let's say uh, five to six hours plus per day, there are negative impacts on their well-being. Okay, there's data to show that as screen time goes up beyond a, what we would probably look at and say, gee, that's a lot. But when we go beyond that amount, that's when we start to see some genuine decreases in well-being. As Christy said, it displaces so many other activities that matter, like connecting with people or like being physically active and so on. In fact, <clears throat> if I can just do a, a quick, I'm not trying to flog you a book here, but as Christy was talking about all the things that our children should be doing, it reminded me of a list that I put in my book, 10 things every parent needs to know. And the conversation that we have with our children when they want screen time goes like this. You can see here, we've got this list of all the different activities that our children need to have done before they have screen time. They say, can I have some time on my screens? And, and in our family, we love to say yes to our children. We say, yes, of course you can. When you have, oh, and I've gone to the wrong page. I got so hard. Here, here it is here. <clears throat> I was on the wrong page. When you have played outside, spent time with a real person face to face, done your chores, read a book, done some exercise, gone for a walk or a ride or been active in some other way, helped someone in the family, tidied your room, prepared things for school tomorrow, had a chat with your grandparents on the phone, done something creative, finished any projects or other schoolwork, baked or cooked something, taken a bath, pursued a hobby. And if the kids say, yeah, I did all that. We say, well, go for your life, get into it. The reason is because we don't want screens to displace other aspects of their lives that help them to have a whole childhood. So it's not about what kind, it's about how much. In the same way that it's not about how much food time our kids have had today, it's about what they've actually consumed. Now, content matters is my first C. And so I really want to emphasize this. Uh, Christy mentioned three other C's that all fa fall under the umbrella of content. That is, content can either be for consumption creation or connection. Now with some things, there's overlap between those three. So some connection, such as on Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat is also very much consumption, but it could also be a bit of creation as well. I mean, TikTok is very creative if you wanna have fun with it. And so too is Instagram and let's face it, even Snapchat can be creative if you wanna call the filters creative. Um, so it's, th there are some blurred lines here, but I guess the main thing is, the data would suggest that when we're involved in consumption, that's the equivalent of the fairy floss. We don't want too much of that. In fact, Jean Twenge from San Diego University and Jonathan Haidt, one of the world's foremost psychological thinkers, are both very much in agreement that consumption, specifically social media consumption, does have a negative impact on well-being, in particular for teenage girls. It seems to be the one finding that doesn't get argued about too much when it comes to screens, no matter which side of the fence people are on with all the other things. And so we want to be really careful about consumption, whether it's YouTube or Netflix or Disney Plus or Stan or Amazon, whatever, you know, you, whatever you're subscribing to. And by the way, there was a really smart question that somebody asked earlier in the Q&A. Uh, Anthony said, does screen time include television? We're not actually including television in most of these conversations. However, there's plenty of data that shows that excessive screen time is unhealthy for our children's well-being for the same reasons that Christy mentioned, because it displaces connection and it displaces physical activity and the pursuit of art and craft and hobbies and you know playing the piano or whatever it is. So content matters, less consumption, more creation and connection. Well, that can go either way. There's high quality connection, and there's not quite as high quality connection and we want to be wise around that. The second C that I want to emphasize is context. Again, Christy's highlighted this, so I'm only going to spend 30 seconds reinforcing it because I just don't think we can say it enough. We've got to make sure that we draw clear boundaries around those times where screens are simply not going to work. And, and I have the same guidelines that you've mentioned, Christy. Uh, I, in my own home and in my interactions with parents, make it really clear 
keep screens out of bedrooms to the very best of your ability. Now, there may be some times where you're gonna let them get away with it for whatever reason, but be really explicit. This is a one-off. This is because of this situation or that circumstance. For the most part, find a way to keep screens out of bedroom, be creative. It's, it's just in your children's best interest from a safety point of view, from a sleep point of view, and from a habit point of view. My other big one's the dinner table. Whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, when my family's together and when your family's together, it's a time for conversation. It's a time for engagement. And so they would be the big ones that I would throw in around context. But you could also add when you've got friends over. Now, I know that that's a bit of a pre-COVID-19 thing, but friends coming over will become a thing again soon if, if you want it to be, uh, from what I can see. All right, uh, there's one more C, and that is that your child matters. Your child matters. I, I've noticed in the um, in the chat. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. Anthony wanted to know which page number I was on. Anthony, I just saw that in the chat. I apologise. I'll find it for you shortly, and I'll throw it into the chat for you. Um, your child may have special needs. So I, I'm trying to find the name of the person who let me know, and I can't find it just now. I think her name was Trish. Said that she has a seven year old with ASD, uh, and there's been a handful of people who have said, "Look, I've got." Um, I've got kids that have got uh, ADHD or I've got this particular need or that particular need. And so it would be, I think, nothing short of arrogant for Christy and I to sit here and say, this is how much screen time and this is the way it needs to be because every child has different needs and Christy's already highlighted that. But those, well, it's the three, those three C's with three specifically under the idea of content are going to be important drivers for your conversations with your children around screens. Now, there's been a handful of uh, chat content come through that I just want to be responsive to. Uh, Christy and I have made a commitment that we're going to be responsive as best we can. Uh, Tara says, my 14 year old daughter doesn't believe there is a problem having her phone at night in her room. I'll be showing her this recording. Christy's smiling as I read that out. And, and Christy, you, you might want to chime in here as well. But Tara, what I would say is be gentle in the way you do that. You don't want to create World War Three, And we're going to give you some tips for how you can have productive conversations with your 14 year old daughter about this topic so that it doesn't uh, turn into chaos. Christy, anything that you want to add now or should we wait for later for that? I think we'll wait for later. Okay. Shraddha said, and I love this question, should I allow my 12 year old to have Snapchat and TikTok? And the answer is no way. Are you kidding? I mean, I don't want to shame or blame or sound judgy or anything, but no. Uh, <laughs> Christy, that, why don't you go first? Why would you not allow a 12 year old other than the legal issue where in the United States, they're not allowed to collect data on kids under 13. Uh, why would you say no? Uh, that 13 year age recommendation, as you said, is the adherence to um, COPRA, the, the legal age when you can obtain data. But more importantly, I think we need to ask when are our children developmentally um, able to cope with the demands of social media? Um, usually that 12 or the, for most social media platforms, the age recommendation is 13 years of age. I know some adults. I'm sorry. I know some adults that aren't mature enough to have social media. Absolutely. So please do not be in a rush to prematurely dunk your children in the digital stream. Um, I often use the analogy with parents that if your eight-year-old son came home and said to you, can I have the keys to the car? I'd like to go and do burnouts tonight, dad. There is no way we would do that. It would be just a hard no. Um, equally, your 11-year-old daughter comes home and says, how about a shot of tequila um, with our meal tonight, mum? We would just say a hard no. And I know many parents say, but I'm worried that my child will be socially ostracised because all of their peer group has said platform. I'm um, the only one. I'm the only one in my grade yeah. that doesn't and I, have it. And I say to parents, fact check that because, and what you can do where you can, and I know sometimes the, the ship has already sailed for some parents, but where you can do what your children are going to do to you, and that is collectively bargain. Get in with their parents in their peer group and say, can we all be on the same page here? Can we all adhere to the recommended um, age limits with these apps and delay the introduction? I am yet to meet a parent in Australia who tells me that they regret delaying the introduction of, of social media. I hear plenty of parents who say the other, I wished we'd held off. I, you know, it became a very slippery slope once we introduced it. So I think hold firm on your boundaries. And what I've ex I found, um, especially I saw a comment asking, how do you explain some of these things to um, teenagers? What I have found works particularly well with adolescents and younger children too, but particularly for adolescents is when we give them facts and science behind 
with our decisions, that I'm not doing this to win the rights or the title of the world's worst parent. I'm doing this because it, this is the impact it will have. And it's really hard for our kids to argue against facts and science. And it's also really hard for them when we tell them we are doing this because we love them. Um, so I think it, it's really important. It's not easy. And I will admit, you know, my nine your old son is telling the only boy in all of Australia who doesn't have his own gaming console um, and I'm okay with that um, so I think we have to be confident in our decisions and do it from what we know is best for our kids let's address some more of that a little bit later I, I love what you're saying uh, Anthony which page number it was page 160 Kelly saying how realistic is that Kelly both both Christy and I really work hard on living in the real world with the advice that we give so we're going to make sure that we give you the the ideas that are necessary to help you to actually make it real. Uh, Lena has said, um, I just highlighted uh, the ages again. Uh, Trudy's agreeing about how realistic it is. Uh, this is this is an interesting one. TikTok attracted a lot of girls, says Ivy. Uh, primary school girls, it makes me worried. And the bad thing is your kid will argue to you saying that their classmates and friends are all using this app and playing these games. We're gonna talk more about that, but Christy's already ad uh, addressed that briefly. Uh, and somebody also said, uh, the content, uh, Kelly says, the content on TikTok is shocking, even as an, even as an adult. Uh, my response to TikTok is this, um, TikTok may just be the worst thing on the internet, uh, but TikTok may also just be the best thing on the internet. <laughs> like, if, you can, if you can avoid the, the content that's explicit and coarse and degrading, it is so much fun. Like you could lose, you could lose weeks just playing around on TikTok. Anyway, let's move on because we do need to get back to the, the content of our presentation tonight. Uh, I know, know it's not a good habit, but my daughter watches videos in her bed to get to sleep. Uh, let me suggest that it's not a good habit and your daughter will eventually learn to sleep without videos and she'll be glad for it. Uh, when the time comes. Um, okay, and, and I think that that's probably uh where we're up to amy graham loves your analogies amy uh, amy has just released uh through the university of new south wales the growing up digital australia report and i've just interviewed her for my podcast i'm excited to share the results of that i think it's going to be really helpful and and look i think we're going to have to move on because we could spend all night in the chat this we're becoming addicted. We're just like the kids. Okay, let's move on to question two. Uh, the, the second biggest question that uh, came through, and I think this is a, a really, well, we've seen it already in so many of the comments. Uh, and by the way, thank you to those of you who are sending through the Q&A questions. We will address the Q&A as we move towards the end of the presentation. My child is so cranky when I tell him or her to get off the screen. This one's a really interesting one because um, when you think about it, when someone tells you to get off the screen, do you ever look up and say, oh yeah, good point, I've been on here too long. Uh, I think that sometimes we need to be a little kinder to our children and recognize that we're not always patient when we're asked to get off our screens and they're probably in the middle of their most important game ever or they're about to get their highest score ever or they're watching their favorite episode and this is their favorite show and can I just please get to the end of this. You know, our timing is always wrong when we're asking them to get off their screens. And so we've got to be able to work through this in a, in a productive way. I think we want to be respectful even when our children are using screens. So for those of you with younger children, what I recommend is, a, well, there's a couple of really simple strategies and I'll explain some of the theory behind this once I've run through these strategies. First off, um, on my website, I've got these things called technology tickets. I'm not trying to sell them, they're free at happyfamilies.com.au and you can download the technology tickets and literally all you do is you print them up and you give them to the kids and you say, this is how many minutes you get on screens today. And then you set the timer and once their time's up, they hand it back. You wouldn't believe how effective this is. So our six-year-old, uh, since we've been doing, you know, COVID homeschool, home learning kind of stuff, our six-year-old started to get a little bit out of control with her screen time. When she wasn't on the, uh, on the PC, she would go and grab hold of the iPad. And when the iPad was taking off her, she would go and find a phone because I've got six kids. Like there's a lot of phones in our house. Uh, they don't all have phones, by the way, but there's, there's at least five or six iPhones going around our house. Uh, and then she would also disappear and hide in the TV room and turn the TV down really low. And we discovered this, this kid was getting like six or seven hours of screen time a day. Well, this has got to stop. So we bought one of those egg timers, you know, from Kmart. And, and, it, and we said, we're going to set the timer. 
and here's your technology ticket and you got 15 minutes. And it's amazing when that goes, she gets up and turns off the TV or the iPad and, and she's done. We found that it's been a, an extremely useful strategy for younger children to use some sort of an alarm system, some sort of a some sort of a barter system. And it's not about prizes and rewards. It's just about saying this is a reasonable amount of time. And once you've had that, let's go and do something else. That's been a really effective strategy for us. Let me tell you what's really going on here for younger children and for children who have additional needs, usually what we find is that their regulatory capacity is underdeveloped. They're just not particularly mature. And when I say regulatory capacity, I mean, have you noticed that when they've got emotions, let, let's think of your average three or four year old, for example, when they have a big emotion, it's either on or it's off. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no sort of volume switch. It's full bore or it's zero. This is what we call emotional regulation. So as adults, we can start to get a little bit cranky and make it really clear that we're getting upset without being at a hundred. But our kids, once you know, when they're three or four, maybe even five, they go from zero to hundred in 1.2 seconds. And whenever I'm doing a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a parent, they say, oh, my child is just so, so explosive. Uh, well, that, that's, that's most kids. That's just how they are. When we say to a child, even a child up to 10 or 12, or even a teenager from time to time, hey, it's time to get off your screen. What happens is we're kind of interrupting the flow of their life. They're, they're going a certain direction. They're sort of wandering down this path. And we're saying, Oi, get off that path. We're ripping them back and putting them on a different path. And frankly, it's really jarring for them. And so they react in ways that aren't necessarily polite. There's got to be a better way. Now, I've mentioned the egg timer. Another thing that we have found helpful is that we give the children transition warnings. So we'll call out and say, you've got 10 more minutes. Or well, I get them to look at the timer. How many more minutes have you got left? And by giving them those gentle reminders, you've got five minutes to go, you've got two minutes to go. Okay, it sounds like the buzzer just went, time to hop off. The children adapt and respond much better because they've had time to get their head facing the direction we want it to face rather than staring at the screen. But there are three basic psychological needs that our children all have, and so do we as adults. The difficulty is that screens seem to meet these psychological needs better than the real world. The first one is relatedness. There's something about being on the screen and being able to connect with people and either play games with them or be on social media or whatever it is that we're doing. Screens facilitate relatedness in an immediate and rewarding way, quite often much better than being in the living room with the family does. And when our children are feeling connected, they don't want to get off their screens because that relatedness need is being met so well. When you look at the multiplayer games that are online, when you look at the way the social media platforms work, they're all about satisfying this relatedness need in profoundly effective ways. And that's why it's so hard to get them off. You know, I want to play because all my friends are on there. And if, I'm not, if I miss out on the game and we don't, and they get through on the mission and I'm one level behind, I'll never catch up. It's that kind of thing with our, with our kids. Or I've got to be on there because that way I can chat while we're building this city together in Minecraft or Roblox or whatever it is that the, that the kids are doing. Relatedness needs are met profoundly well. Then there's the competence needs. Have you noticed how often your children feel incompetent as they go about their lives? And how often we remind them of their incompetence? What do you mean you can't find your shoes? This is the third school jumper this year that you've lost. What do you mean you've lost your jumper? Uh, you know, we, we have these steady reminders of all the things that they're not doing quite so well. But when they're online, they feel like they're capable and competent. They're in they're in control and they know what they're doing. When they're playing a game, the game is always just one fraction above their level. It's just enough to make them feel like they're so, so good and so, so close, but not quite there. Competence needs are met in, again, extraordinarily intentional ways in the technology that our children and we are using. Whereas that doesn't happen in real life. We often feel quite incompetent in real life. But perhaps the biggest thing might just be autonomy. When I'm on my screen, no one can tell me what to do. I'm in my own virtual world. I'm in my own virtual space. I'm living my life the way I want. Think about how well these needs are met offline. How often do our children feel like they're struggling with their relationships and they've got no one to connect to? How often do they feel incompetent? And how often are they being told what to do and feel like they have no control over their lives? Screens give them a respite from all of that and actually support these basic psychological needs so much that 
we and our children enjoy being on screens because those needs are met so well. And so I, I think, I think perhaps the biggest thing that I want to emphasize with the autonomy thing, Christy, is we think that we're in control. You know, we think that we're on these devices and we are making our own decisions and we are in control, but it would seem that that's probably not quite right. Uh, you are correct. Um, unfortunately, we're not. And I want to just elaborate on what you said before. Our kids often gravitate towards screens because they crave that sense of agency. As you said, one of their core psychological needs, Justin, is that need for autonomy. And when they're online, they think that they get to choose, and I use that word very loosely, what YouTube clip they select next or what um, interesting content comes into their Instagram or TikTok feed. But we need to be very mindful um, that there are some persuasive design techniques. The Google recommendation algorithm is what's determining what comes in in terms of recommended content or what the recommended, you know, that very tempting panel on the right hand side of YouTube or YouTube kids. Um, that is based on the, the Google recommendation algorithm. Now, this can be fine if your child is searching and looking at age appropriate content, but your daughter only ever needs to look up one self harm video, your son only ever needs to look up one inappropriate website, and what starts to populate their feed is more inappropriate content. So unfortunately, um, as you'll see, Justin's going to hit the slide here. Um, technology has been designed in ways that works not only towards our psychological drivers, but there are also some really deliberate design techniques that make technology so appealing that we can't stop. One of the reasons that kids find it so hard and get really agitated when they need to switch off is because they feel like they're never done. In the online world, there is never a point of completion. I refer to this as the state of insufficiency. The online world is basically a bottomless bowl. There are no stopping cues. It's a bit like an infinity, you know, those lovely infinity swimming pools that you often see. The online world just keeps going and going. And so our children find it hard to switch off because there's always another game they can play, another level they can get to. They can refresh their social media feed. And just interesting aside here, when you refresh social media, have you ever noticed that you pull down? That gesture imitates the cranking of a lever on a poker machine. They are just some of the very subliminal design techniques that have been de have deployed. So this is why we need to give our children, as Justin said, those endpoints. We need to help them transition. Another very clever way that a lot of particularly um, multiplayer video games and apps that are designed specifically for children, uh, they deploy music. Now, a lot of the music is very hypnotic. It's very repetitive. I don't know if you've ever listened. Perhaps you've tuned out when your kids are playing Minecraft. But a lot of these apps have very hypnotic and melodic music and this has been designed it's also I'm not musical but I have friends who are musical and tell me that a lot of that music is in the note of C this music um, gets children into the, the state of flow where they become so engrossed with what they're doing that they literally lose track of time and this is why your children often look at you with their puppy dog eyes when you tell them it's time to turn off and they say to you but I only just started you know they're not testing your parenting skills they have literally entered this flow state I often refer to it as that digital zombie state. Um, it's the exact same type of music that is played in the background at shopping centres and at casinos when we used to be able to go to casinos. So this is why we have to give our kids and help them um, to regulate their use on screen because these design techniques make it so tempting for them to just keep going and going. Um, please. Uh, if, if you don't mind, I want to jump in. I'm, I'm being a little bit, um, well, I, I just want to share something that You've just reminded me of it. I've reached over to my bookshelf behind me and I've grabbed Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. I don't know if you've seen this or not, but I, I just want to read a, a quick paragraph to you because it's, it's so perfectly aligned with what you said. And I, I wasn't aware that you were going to say this, even though I've seen the slides. I didn't read them that carefully. But that whole flow state and losing track of time. Have you, have you seen Percy Jackson? I have. I think I know that what you're going to refer to here. It's perfect. Okay, so... So in the, in the movie, it's a little bit different to the book, but for those of you who haven't seen Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief, Percy and Annabeth and Grover are racing across America. They're, they've got to save the world. It's a pretty important mission. You wouldn't think that you'd forget that. Try to save Percy's mum from Hades as well at the same time. But they get to Las Vegas and they need some rest and recuperation. They're exhausted because they've been trying to save the world as they travel across the United States. And they get to the Lotus Hotel and Casino. When they walk in there, it says the whole lobby was a giant game room. And I'm not talking about cheesy old Pac-Man games or slot machines. 
There was an indoor water slide snaking around the glass elevator, which went straight up at least 40 floors. There was a climbing wall on the side of one building, an indoor bungee jumping bridge. There were virtual reality suits with working laser guns and hundreds of video games, each one the size of a widescreen TV. And then he goes on to describe how awesome it was to play those video games. And he gets to this point where he's playing the video games with a guy called Darren, D-A-R-R-I-N. It's an old fashioned way to spell Darren, isn't it? And he says, I'm not sure when I first realized something was wrong. I was standing next to this guy called Darren. He kept saying, groovy man, been here two weeks and the games keep getting better and better. Percy says, groovy? Later while we were talking, I said something rocked and he looked at me kind of puzzled as if he'd never heard that word used that way before. Uh, I said, hey, Darren, what year is it? He frowned at me. In the game? No, in real life. He had to think about it. 1977. And Percy goes and tries to find out what year it is from other people, but they're all glued to their screens. Some say 1985, another one 1993. Then it occurred to me, how long had I been here? Seemed like only a couple of hours, but was it? Then he tries to remember why he's here and he can't even remember because the game has just fogged up his mind so much. Now in the movie, at this point, one of the security guards speaks into his little watch and says, Percy Jackson is awake. That's not in the book, but it's a great line in the movie. But here's what Percy says when he finds Annabeth and, and Annabeth's building her virtual city. And he says, Annabeth, we need to leave. She looks up annoyed. What? This place is a trap. Annabeth, there are people here from 1977, kids who have never aged. You check in and you stay forever. Boom. Perfect. <laughs> Sorry, back to you. I couldn't help myself. That, that is the perfect way to describe that, that flow state or that digital zombie state that so many parents experience with their kids. Um, and it is hard. I think we acknowledge as adults, um, we find it hard to digitally disconnect. And it's often because we become so enraptured with what we're doing. Um, one of the other deliberate design techniques is that technology that our kids use often, and we use as well, often use metrics. And so um, we often get a bubble um, and it's a red bubble, um, but these metrics are a very tangible reminder of, of how many videos we get to watch. Or for us as adults, how many unread emails we might have. Um, for our kids, it might be how many social media notifications they need. And so these, um, the use of metrics have been deliberately designed to get us hooked and using these technologies. We also know even the simple design of icons that your children see on their tablets and touchscreen devices and laptops have been very specifically chosen. Um, when Steve Jobs released the first iPod years ago in one of his press releases, he said that he wanted the icons on your iPod to be so appealing that you wanted to lick your phone. That tells you a little bit about the, um, the captivating way that these technologies um, can trick us. And that there was no COVID-19 back then. Yes, very true. <laughs> just, just on that, Christy, I, I'm not sure if, uh, I'm sure you know this, but even the, the Facebook notification, it's red, all notifications are red now, but when they first designed it, it was blue to yep. fit in with the Facebook color scheme. But people weren't clicking on it and they made it red and all of a sudden, we've got, we've got the jackpot, we've got people's attention. That's right, because we associate red with danger and urgency and importance. So you can see that we are struggling as parents. As Justin said, these technologies captivate or appeal to their psychological drivers, those three needs. We also know that we have some deliberate design techniques. And then we, we couple this with the way our child's um, brain is developing. Um, we know that the, this prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that helps with self-regulation, it is still under development. For those of you who are raising boys, I need to break some bad news to you. Uh, the male prefrontal cortex does not fully develop until uh, we're estimating around 27 to 29 years of age. I know I can hear you. I have three sons. Um, and for those of you sitting there smugly thinking, thank goodness I have daughters, Justin, I'm sure will attest to this, that the female prefrontal cortex doesn't fully develop until the early 20s. Now, this is the part of the brain that helps with self-regulation. This is why our kids find it so difficult to moderate their online activity. Not only has it been designed to captivate and tap into their psychological drivers, but their brain lacks the capacity. It basically is like putting them 
them on a bike with no brakes and popping them on a downhill slope. Um, being able to regulate their use online is near impossible. One of the other reasons that's related to the way their brain is developed is that when they use a lot of the online games and uh, social media platforms that they like to do, it often elevates their sensory or it overloads, I should say, their sensory and their nervous system. And so this, again, makes it really challenging for them to regulate and moderate their use. So I'm also going to tell you, and I think we know this firsthand as our, ourselves as adults, um, but for our children whose brain is still developing, when they're using the platforms that they often like to do for leisure, so gaming platforms, social media, watching YouTube, watching um, commercial television, is that it's usually pleasurable for them. And like anything in life that we do that is pleasurable, the brain releases dopamine, the um, positive neurotransmitter. Now, Neuro, a dopamine can be great. Dopamine can help us focus. It, it is essential for learning. But dopamine um, makes children want more and more of it. And so this is why, um, as Justin said, when they're midway through a game and you tell them to unplug and go and set the dinner table or um, turn off the device and go and do their maths homework, one of the reasons that you get the aggressive, angry, frustrated um, emotions, that emotional combustion afterwards, is because you are terminating their supply of dopamine. So I loved Justin's suggestion of having appealing trends or, or warning them that their time is ending. Um, I often refer to this as cognitive priming. Um, and if I was halfway through a, a trashy bit of TV and my husband came out and said, Christy, turn off the TV, I would be irate. But we do this to our kids all of the time. And one of the benefits if we prime our children that their time is going to end online is that they can finish the level. They can send the message to their friends, letting them know that they will be exiting the group chat. They can submit their, own, you know, maybe they're actually doing some online learning or homework. They can upload their finished work or save what they're doing. So we prime them to get ready so that we're not just sort of amputating their supply of dopamine. The other thing that I found well um, as a parent is giving them appealing transition activities. If they're getting these dopamine hits when they're using the device, to say to them, put your console away and go and do your maths homework, we know is not an appealing transition activity. Put your phone away, stop TikToking and go and tidy your bedroom. Equally, um, not an enticing activity. So we need to give them, they don't need a long menu, but a choice of two. When you've turned off the iPad, would you like to jump on the trampoline or walk the dog? When you've put your phone away, would you like to have a shower or would you like to go and read your book? Choosing, choosing two activities that you know that they like doing. Now, the second thing I just want to say here about dopamine um, is that when they get hits of dopamine, the other problem with dopamine is not only do they want more of it, which hooks them into using the device for longer, but the second problem with dopamine is that dopamine floods our prefrontal cortex. It hijacks that logical part of the brain that helps with self-regulation. Now, remember, this part of the brain isn't fully developed, so it is at limited capacity as it is. But when we're getting hits of dopamine, we can't switch off. I'm going to have a guilty confession here. This is why I sometimes say I'm going to have one square of dark chocolate. And one all of a sudden becomes two squares, becomes four squares, can sometimes become the whole box because that okay. dopamine it's is okay. Dark, it's dark okay. Chocolate healthy, dark chocolate. Thank healthy. you. Antioxidants. <laughs> So that can help to explain why our kids find it difficult. So um, I'm going to wrap up here. I'm on the next slide. Um, explain that throwing techno tantrums is actually considered a typical sign or a typical stage of, um, student, of children's development. Um, it may be a red flag for problematic use if the tantrums are intense, if they become persistently um, physically aggressive. But in most instances, for the majority of children, the techno tantrum is their body's way of trying to self-regulate. Often what they're doing, if, especially if their sensory and their nervous system has been hyper aroused, if they've been watching fast paced cartoons or playing a video game, is they're trying to discharge all of the cortisol, that stress hormone that has built up. Um, so some really practical strategies that I have road tested for you as a mum, 
when they're throwing the techno tantrum, if you can, please don't put yourself in danger and you might need to, to duck and weave, touch your child, cuddle them, put your hand on their shoulders. Um, you know, you might need to dodge the, the, the fists or the, the aggressive behavior, but when you physically touch them, you release oxytocin. Oxytocin is the love hormone. It's the social bonding hormone. So sometimes you don't need to say anything. Sometimes it's just the physical touch that will help um, de-escalate that um, stress response. Um, we mentioned before, instead of giving children, and one of the comments, I think it was Tara who was saying um, that children, her son finds it really hard to turn off Fortnite as many multiplayer video games have been intentionally designed um, because it's that infinity pool analogy. But the reason is that um, we need to give, I think, especially if your children are under about eight to 10 years of age, rather than giving them an amount of time, give them quantities, let them know how many YouTube episodes they can watch or what level they can get to in the game. Time is a very abstract concept. Um, and for many young children, particularly under eight to 10 years of age, they don't have a, a, a conceptual understanding of what an hour or half an hour is. And even if they do, often they get into that flow state. So that's where, like Justin said, using some uh, timers, you know, an egg timer or the microwave or the kitchen timer can work well. Um, encourage your child to switch off the device. It sounds almost too simple to be effective. Um, but again, Justin explained your child wants autonomy and the fact that they shut the lid or they turn the device down off or put it away helps them um, feel like they've got some locus of control. I've also found two more um, physical movement. Um, I often talk about green time after screen time, getting them out in nature, um, but doing something physically active helps to discharge that cortisol, also gives them a hit of that dopamine and serotonin that they've been getting on the screen. Um, and I also think um, a lot of parents say, well, I get frustrated. And so when they don't behave and they have the massive epic tantrum or meltdown, my natural tendency is to confiscate the device and to punish them by taking it away. And Justin uses a wonderful 3E framework um, that explores why perhaps punishment is not the best option in those situations. Yeah, I might, um, I might jump in and, and share that. And, and then we'll move on to our third major question that we're going to address. Now, I, I want to acknowledge just briefly as well that we've kind of hit that 45 minute mark. We've gotten a little bit carried away because we're having such a great time, but thank you for persisting with us. So uh, I, I want to address, you know, as Christy said, this response is normal, uh, but that doesn't mean that it's something that we want to see happening. I mean, it's just horrible for the whole family when the kids are having these tantrums. And each of those strategies can be really useful in the moment. I think that, uh, well, I, I would encourage all of them. I think, I think they're really wise. But what I would also suggest is that out of the moment, we have a conversation with our kids that's centered on what I call the three E's. Now, this is going to address most of the conversation points that have come through the chat and also a handful of the questions that have come through the Q&A. So the three E's, they don't work in the moment. So let's say we finish this webcast in 15 minutes or so and you walk out of the room and you discover that your children are all there staring at a screen. This is not the time to sit down and say, you know what kids, we need to have a conversation about the three E's. It won't work because emotions are probably going to be pretty high. Nobody wants to have a logical, rational, level, balanced conversation when emotions are up here. In fact, high emotions, low intelligence. Uh, you've probably noticed that in your own life, you know, when, when emotions are high, it's very hard to, to be intelligent, but when we can bring emotions back down, we can have some really intelligent conversations. So when things are calm, when people are not in front of screens, what I recommend is we have a conversation with the kids about what the boundaries should be, what our expectations are and about these tantrums and epic meltdowns. And the three E's are that we explore, we explain, and we empower. I'm going to give you a, a quick snapshot of theory and then show you how that actually works with real people. Okay. Cause somebody said before, you know, are we really living in the real world here? Well, I'm going to give you some real world in just a sec. Uh, the, the explore bit goes like this. You're really struggling with this. This is really important to you. Uh, explore is where we step into the emotional world of our children and try to get what's going on for them. Why does this matter so much? Why do you fight with us so much about this? Why is this such a big deal? You don't have good exploration conversations, by the way, 
in the middle of, you know, the, 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 you, you don't want to turn it into a battle. It's not a heat of the moment kind of thing. I actually recommend organizing a milkshake, play the cookies, some, some, make the conversation a treat. Hey, I want to have a, one of those awkward dad conversations. I want to have one of those difficult mum conversations with you. We want to have one of those parent conversations, but guess what? We've got ice cream and we've got whatever your favorite goodies are. Let's go and sit down and have this chat and we'll, we'll feed you all your favorite things. So you can't be too mad at us while we're talking to you about it. Is it bribery? Well, kind of, but, but it will get the job done. As you sit down, you, you pretty much preface it by saying, all right, so this is going to be a bit of a challenge, but we don't want to be cranky. We want to actually be, be sensible together. You're nine years old. You're 12 years old. You're six years old. And we've noticed that there's been lots of big fights lately about technology and screens. And we're getting cranky at you for using it too much. And you're getting cranky because we want you to get off it. Can you help us to know why you get so cranky about this? So we're exploring. The phrase that I use is you want to get curious, not furious. You want to lean in and understand. And don't just listen to their words. Listen to the feelings in their heart. As maybe your big kids say, I miss my friends. Or if I don't play the game, I'm not going to be part of the conversation tomorrow. Or um, if all my girlfriends are on Instagram and I'm not part of the group chat, then I'm not part of the friendship group. I mean, I've got to be there. So we want to listen for those emotions. We want to listen to what they're saying and really explore. Once we've explored well enough that we get it here, not just here, but we get it here, then we explain. Explain should be as short as possible. In fact, the longer I've been talking about these three E's, the more convinced I am that we almost want to keep explain to less than 10 seconds. So we might say something like this. Well, you know, and I know that the screen time as it currently exists is causing problems in our family. And that's maybe all we might say. We might say, as Christy said before, there's a couple of really interesting facts that I've learned about how screen time is affecting your brain, particularly your sleep. And I just want to run them by you. Do you mind if I do that? Um, we're getting almost consent from our kids to be able to share the science and the facts because it is hard to argue with the science and the facts. But, you know, sometimes, the, sometimes some particularly obstinate oppositional kids will still want to argue about everything. You know, the sky's blue. No, it's not. It's, you know, some, some kids are just like that. Uh, but what we're trying to do is explain in I don't know, 10 or 20 seconds. We don't want to turn into a lecture because they will go to sleep. Even if their eyes are looking at us, they'll be like, oh, and, and they'll be asleep in their brain. Their brain will have gone elsewhere. Uh, and then we empower. We might say something like, so what do you think we should do about this? Or where do we go from here? Or how do we fix this? Or what can I do to help you? Empowerment means we actually put it back onto our kids. And so long as your children are older than about four, four five, maybe six, you'll be able to have this conversation one way or another with them. And you'll be amazed at how effective it is. So they're the three E's. Let me give you the, the story that goes along with the three E's. I've actually got several of them from families outside my own and from my own kids. But my favorite story is one that actually happened in real life with my, or well, how old was she? I think she was 13 or 14 at the time. One of my kids, I've got, uh, I've got three kids that have all gone beyond that age now. So I can say this without giving it away as to who it was. But anyway, this, this child, Snapchat was the thing at the time. And, and she said, dad, 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 can I have Snapchat? And I said, no. And she said, why not? And I said, because I'm your dad. And I said, no, she said, that's not an excuse. And you're a parenting expert. And you're not supposed to say that sort of stuff. And I said, oh, I don't want to have this conversation, but fine, I'll have the conversation. I was about to launch into the big tirade about all the reasons that she shouldn't have Snapchat. And I paused and I remembered the three E's of effective discipline. I said, all right, I'll tell you what, kiddo. Why don't you tell me why it's so important that you have Snapchat? Help me to really understand, not just here, help me to understand here. And she said, dad, because I'm the only one in my grade that doesn't have it. And I'm like, you're always the only one in your grade. That's, that line has been used for the last seven decades. Everyone's the only one in their grade. I bet it's not true. And she said, well, I'm almost the only one in my grade. I said, okay, let's just not exaggerate. There's a bunch of kids that have got it and you want it too. Well, yeah. I said, okay, why else? Well, so I can stay in touch with my friends. Uh huh. Why else? I'm trying to really understand. I want to be curious, not furious. Why else do you want Snapchat? Well, and she gave me a couple of other hopeless reasons. And I wrote them down. She had three or four reasons on this piece of paper that I wrote down. And they were lousy reasons. But the one that really sort of stood out was I want to be able to stay in touch with my friends. I said, well, that's fine. But you've already got Facebook Messenger at the time. That was what everyone was using. I said, you've got Facebook Messenger. Why don't you just chat with them on Facebook? And she said, Dad, they're ignoring my messages. They don't talk to me on Facebook. They're all talking on Snapchat. I said, well, I still think it's a lousy idea and no. 
To which she replied, Dad, I've been to your seminars and I know that that's not how this conversation is supposed to go. I'm like, oh gosh, all right, fine, have it your way. I said, okay, well, I think that I pretty well understand why you feel like you need to have Snapchat. So here's why I don't want you to have it. And then I had a brainwave. I said, instead of me lecturing you about why you shouldn't have it, why don't you tell me what you think my reasons are for not wanting you to have it? Now, this was a stroke of genius because it gets her brain going. She's actually got to be me now. She's got to take my perspective. So we wrote out all the reasons that I wouldn't want her to have Snapchat. And she gave me a really darn good list. But she missed a couple of things, which I put on the list as well. I said, don't forget, kiddo, I get paid to teach people, to teach parents how to have these conversations with their kids. My list is better than yours. So my answer has to be no. And she said, dad, that's not how it goes. Explore, explain, empower. And I said, I don't want to do this because I don't think you should have it. And I don't want to empower you because you're going to say you should have it. And I'm going to say you shouldn't have it. And we're going to end up at a stalemate. stalemate. And she said, that's because you don't understand why I need it so badly. And she was right. See, I got it here, but I didn't get it here in my heart. I said, fine, why don't you tell me? Why can't you just use Facebook Messenger? Why do you have to have Snapchat? She had a brainwave. And I, I kid you not, this is exactly how the conversation went. She said, Dad, you telling me to be on Facebook with all my friends when they're on Snapchat is like you telling me to go and play at the park when all my friends have gone to the beach. And I went, oh, that was good. <laughs> I said, that was really good. And for, for a brief moment, I said, now I get it here. I'm not just getting it in my head, I'm getting it in my heart. You feel alone and isolated. You feel like you're gonna be ignored and friendless. And she said, yes. I said, well, that's, um, that's pretty impactful. And I get it. I get it in a way that I didn't before. I said, but now I've got to do some more explaining. Because here's the thing, when you go to the beach, there's syringes in the sand and there's broken glass, and there's rips and sweeps and currents, and there's big waves, and there's sharks and blue bottles, and there's the sun, you'll get sunburned, and there's perverts. She looked at me, and without a word of a lie, she said, Dad, have you been to the park lately? And I went, oh, that was good. That was really good. Because I know that on Facebook or on whatever social media platform you want to choose, all that stuff still exists. Now, we were obviously speaking metaphorically, but she was right there with me. And at that point, I said, well, I guess I need to empower you then. How do we fix this? Because I get your point and you're right, but where do we go from here? How do, how do we sort this out? Now, the conversation went back to normal speak, but if I was to extend the metaphor for just another moment, effectively, what she said to me was, Dad, if I told you I wanted to go to the beach and I promised to swim within the flags, and stay with my friends and wear my sun shirt and you know do x y and z would you let me go to the beach under those conditions to which my i replied well so long as i could check in on you at the beach every now and again yeah i probably would and we were able to come up with a a, a way forward where we both felt comfortable with the decisions that were being made now, it may be, as Christy has said, there are some times where as a parent you say, well, that's all well and good, but as your parent, I just have to make this call and I know that you're going to hate me for it and I don't want you to, but my decision is no. And that's okay as well. Like you don't get on this stuff until you're at least 13, maybe even 14, maybe even 15, because you don't really need it. And as the parent, you've got the right to do that. I don't want to disempower you as a parent. But if you're really listening closely to your kids and if they're saying things that do make sense and you can come up with solutions together that work, then you go for it with explore, explain and empower. Now, there's way more that we could talk about all of those things. And I wish that we could. But time really is getting away from us. So I want to move on to the final question. And this is the question that I've, oh, I've been getting nonstop. How do I get any work done when my kids are around without resorting to technology? Like I'm, I'm trying to work from home. The kids are driving me crazy. They're at my feet and they're saying, mom, 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 and dad, dad, dad. And uh, I, I'm just going to give you a couple of ideas and then I'm going to hand over to Christy because the reality is I'm working from home as most people are, but my wife is also at home full time with the kids. So I don't actually see them during the day. I go to the office and I work and I don't get interrupted. Whereas Christy, three kids, nine, six and newborn. Is that right? 15 months. I, 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 that, that's newbornish. Yeah, not nine, six and a toddler. Uh, and, and you're working at home on your own while your husband's going off to work as well. So I'm only going to say a couple of things because really, this is, this is all of you. 
what I want to say is this. Um, if you've got both partners at home, I would suggest working in shifts. Someone take the morning shift, someone take the afternoon shift. Uh, and I'd also recommend working in sprints. So set your kids up with something that you know will occupy them. There's hopefully not too much screen time, but will occupy them. And then sprint. Like, you know, work out what you need to get done and just dive in and go for it, knowing that you've got 20 minutes or you've got 40 minutes or, you know, you've got afternoon nap time, so you'll have an hour and a half and set your day up accordingly. Uh, they're probably the main things that I would say. And I don't want to, I don't want to go on anymore because Christy, like I said, you're the one that's doing it. So what about if I hand over to you and, and you answer this question? Because it's been a, a, a pretty common question. Absolutely. Um, and so this slide that is going to appear magically now um, is to say that this really is uncharted territory. And I love um, the memes that are coming out of this uh, coronavirus uh, crisis that we're facing. Um, I think this is really challenging. So my first um, suggestion and one that I'm living by at the moment um, is to recalibrate your expectations, both in terms of what you can manage in terms of your workload. And I think communicating that to your colleagues, your work colleagues, um, communicating that perhaps to your students, if you're still engaging in remote learning, communicating that to your um, child's teachers, um, communicating even as something as practical um, as having one thing that has freed me up um, to get more work done at convenient times is to set up an auto reply on an auto responder on my email so that when people do email me the uh, sender automatically gets a response and I explain that I'm working compressed hours um, I'm engaging in remote learning with my children and that they can expect an email response within usually 48 hours um, during the, the during business days. But I think if we start to recalibrate our expectations and the expectations of either our clients or our colleagues, um, then it makes it, it basically releases the pressure valve. Um, and I have found that um, incredibly helpful. Um, my next strategy is a very pragmatic one too. Um, and that is to plan your um, weekly, in fact, I think it needs to be done daily, um, but plan your daily schedule and that of your children. If you are still juggling um, homeschooling or remote learning commitments, um, when I talk about your bandwidth, I'm talking about this both literally and metaphorically. Um, in terms of literally, plan when you need to have reliable internet access so that everyone in the family isn't trying to simultaneously engage in video conferencing calls or streaming um, Netflix at the same time. So really map out your daily schedule as a family um, so that you are making sure that the, the or the brand, sorry, the broadband um, bandwidth requirements will meet the, the needs that you have. I've just got was, to in there really quickly as well, Christy. Sorry to interrupt you, but in, in my family, we tried that. And sometimes you actually can't. Uh, and, and, and I want to highlight that. All of these are just suggestions because we know that sometimes you can't. You know, we've got a daughter in year 12, we've got a daughter in year 10, we've got a daughter in year 7, a daughter in year 5, and all four of them are using the devices at the same time because they're supposed to be on for roll call and they're supposed to be involved in those classes. Plus I'm working in my office, there's five of us that are using video conferencing at the same time. The only ones that aren't doing it are my wife and the little one. And sometimes they're doing a like a Facebook live, they're uploading content. Uh, and so it sometimes, sometimes you just can't. And That's right. And so I think if you plan it, that might mean that you know in advance that there's going to be four of us requiring it simultaneously. So rather than going through the home Wi-Fi network, I might hotspot to my phone because that will release some of it. So I think um, often our frustrations mount because we're trying to get our kids onto their Zoom call. We've got another child who's trying to log in and do their virtual roll call. Um, and we're trying to do a virtual conference with our colleagues. And so again, if we've mapped it out, we might know in advance or we might you know, buy an extra dongle just so we can start to alleviate that um, pressure. I also think plan your bandwidth in terms of um, when will your child or children, if you've got multiple ones, um, require your mental bandwidth? When do they need you to be um, present and helping them? So do they need assistance with particular learning tasks at set times of the day? And that really helps you to establish a rhythm or a, um, I guess an anticipated work schedule that will work for both your kids and yourself. 
yourself. Um, and I think this is, you know, something for me, I have found that it is constantly evolving. So I think recalibrating those expectations. Um, the other thing I've found as the next slide shows, this was um, social media and I loved it. Um, I think have designated um, boundaries. When we work from home and it's through no fault of our own or our children, our children think because we are at home that we are accessible um, and because that is often usually the case. But if we are trying to work from home, I think um, establishing a designated work zone and if it can be, I know it's not always possible, um, but if you can physically segregate yourself um, so that you can signal to your kids that you're working. Now, if that's not possible, I found some families, some of my friends are wearing a uniform as in a set of, of clothes that signals to their kids that I'm in work mode. Um, I have a male friend who said what's worked for them is they put a goofy hat on, not when they're video conferencing their colleagues, but they put a goofy hat on and that signals to their kids that, hey, dad's in work mode. Um, even the noise cancelling earmuff headphones can be a great signal to your kids that you're working. And secret confession, even if you're not working, I have found putting them on and pretending that I'm working gives you five minutes of um, solitude. And that will do wonders for your personal mental well-being and your productivity. You are fabulous. Uh, in my next strategy here, um, this sounds really fancy, but this is probably the best tool that I have found that works for me. And that is work to your chronotype. Now, it sounds very fancy, but it basically means um, your chronotype is your natural biological rhythm to be awake and alert. And we all have a, an inbuilt biological rhythm. So we're either, um, we fall into one of three broad categories. We're either a lark, um, an owl, or a middle bird. So this is when our energy is at its peak. So 14% of us are larks, 21% uh, uh, of us are owls, so you're probably firing on all cylinders right now if you're watching this live, and 65% of us are those middle birds. So what that means is that's when our energy is at its peak. Now, Cal Newport um, is a wonderful productivity expert, and he suggests that we do our deep work perfectly timed, Justin, um, but we do our deep work. So do your most taxing, cognitively challenging work tasks. Maybe it's data analysis. Maybe it's writing a presentation. Um, perhaps it is writing a complex proposal. Whatever your taxing tasks are, do those tasks um, when your energy, your, your chronotype is at its peak. So I am a one of those crazy people. I'm one of the 14% who is a lark. So I fire on all cylinders early in the morning. So I have found this time of night is not my most productive. Um, so I find getting up early, I can get some focused work done. And the trick here is that you do your focused work where, where possible. Um, but you have to during that focused time disable your digital distractions. I talk about building a fortress around your focus. And it is so easy for our attention to be hijacked online, you know, the ping of emails or notifications or our phone ringing. When it is that when you've identified your chronotype, so for me, it's first thing in the morning, I get up and do my deep tasks then when I know I'm not going to be distracted. Now, if you are unfortunately a middle bird and that's the peak time of the day, in the middle of the day, often when your kids are up, this is when you need to start to plan what could you assign to them that they could do so you've got that window when you're basically at your peak um, or mental prime. Um, I love this meme that was on social media. Um, and I loved what Justin said about working in sprints. I think we have to re-adjust uh, our traditional notions of work. Um, and so we need to be prepared to work in pockets of time. Um, and one of the things that I have found particularly helpful is to triage my to-do list. So what happens when we often have a big master to-do list, and if yours is anything like mine, it is huge and, and it's a mammoth list. Um, often when we see our to to do list, we often don't discriminate between the tasks on our to do list. So we might have, you know, sending a client email on the same list as doing data analysis and preparing a new presentation. And we don't analyze the complexities of different tasks. So what I have found um, is um, on this slide, Justin, um, having a to-do list where I have a, a, a sort of I have a master list and I break the master list into deep tasks 
and shallow tasks. And so when I find my kids are occupied, they're perhaps doing their online learning or maybe they've found a fun game, they're building a fort with all the cushions that we've ever owned in our whole entire house and building an elaborate fort in the lounge room, in fact, in the doorway to the house, but hey, they're occupied. And I think I've got a 15 minute window here. I will dive into something perhaps on my shallow tasks. So something um, that isn't particularly taxing, but I can get done in sort of that short sprint. So I think if we've got a to-do list, it sort of, it, it alleviates some of the mental load um, that we would otherwise have trying to figure out what we need to do at particular times. When I talked before, I didn't explain um, about, I can see some of you talking about minimizing distractions. Um, and yes, um, Justin has said, um, you know, don't, disable uh, notifications, um, don't open Facebook. I have even found something as pragmatic as maximizing the window that I'm working in. So all of those tempting icons, again, those colors lure us in. Um, I have found the proximity strategy. So putting my phone out of sight so I can't see it when I'm doing that deep work. Um, my really wife, Christy, I actually hand her my phone and say for the next three hours, I'm not available. Can you please look after this? That's a great strategy. Um, switching it to do not disturb mode. And with most phones now, the do not disturb, disturb mode um, settings are so sophisticated that you can set all sorts of rules up. I have mine set up so that when it's on do not disturb mode, whoever is trying to call me gets an, a text message autoresponder, just letting them know that I can't be contacted, but here is an alternative if it's an emergency. Um, there are options to override that. So if you know your partner is trying to contact you or your executive assistant needs to reach you, um, if there are extenuating circumstances, there are ways around it. Um, but really trying to minimize the distractions because if our attention is constantly hijacked and it is when we're working with kids, our stress levels elevate. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to get work done and I've got a child who's saying, I can't load up this, uh, upload this to Google Classroom and another child who's saying, I can't access what's on Seesaw, my stress rate levels are really elevated because when we multitask, our brain releases cortisol. So we need to do whatever we can to decrease that uh, stress level and monotasking, not multitasking, is the one of the best things that we can do. Um, but it's really hard, I will admit. Um, I have personally uh, found juggling remote learning um, with two school-aged children and keeping a toddler alive and out of mischief and simultaneously trying to work as one of the most challenging um, undertakings I have embarked on. Um, so I want to um, let you know that it is um, difficult, but it is also possible. Wow. So this is handed over to you for that. Now, Christy, we're going to have to wrap up. We've gone a little bit over time. Uh, for people who want to contact you and get more information, uh, this is all of your details here, drchristygoodwin.com. Is there anything that you want to mention about that? No, but if you go there, there's all sorts of resources. Um, you can access a free digital wellbeing checklist that you can print out and put on the fridge and just check that your kids are developing healthy um, and helpful digital behaviours. Fantastic. That sounds great. And my website is happyfamilies.com.au. By the way, we are going to answer a bunch of your questions that have been coming through as well. I'll do that in just a sec or we'll, we'll dive into that in a sec. But uh, I've got a free ebook for you as a thank you for participating in this webcast. Uh, it's called How the Heck? How the heck are we supposed to do this? Solutions to the four biggest challenges you're facing at the moment in the middle of a global pandemic and everything that's going on. So uh, please visit our websites and take advantage of those resources that are there. Thank you so much for the kind comments that are already coming through. We're gonna go for another couple of minutes and answer just a handful of questions. I think if we can work Christy towards trying to answer one every 60 seconds, really yep. rapid fire. Here's the first one. How do we manage things when siblings of different ages are together? I'll let you go first and then I'll add to that. Okay, so um, I would try, and again, this is very challenging depending on the age range of your kids. Where possible, um, try to find content that they could use together. We call it um, joint media engagement, but we know that it is much better for kids to be using technology with somebody, be it a peer or a parent or a sibling. Um, this is where tools like Common Sense Media and the eSafety Commission uh, and website and the Australian um, Council on Children and the Media can help you drill down to age appropriate content. Um, 
However, that is challenging, particularly if you've got multiple children and multiple devices. So sometimes it's a matter of trying to um, find something that a, perhaps a tandem use of the screen could um, warrant um, or trying to find some alternatives that they could do perhaps in a solo activity, um, but so that they're not conflicting each other, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I'll dive in because with six children aged from six through to early 20s, we are living the dream right now. And, and it's really challenging because the big kids are allowed to engage with content that is completely inappropriate for a six-year-old or a 10-year-old. Uh, and so what we do is we just make sure that the big kids know that there are times where they can use the screens to enjoy the way they want to. And there are times where they have to be mindful that there are little kids around. And it's, we, we actually put the responsibility on the big kids. Uh, we don't just say, well, you, you've got to police it. We, we do the policing of it to some degree, but we let the big kids know that the lowest common denominator wins in terms of the content that will be displayed. And again, as parents, we've got the right to do that and step in. There's a handful of other things I'd like to share, but I want to move through, like I said, at these questions fairly quickly. Some kids are using screens for self-soothing. Self what other strategies can you suggest? I'll jump in first really quickly on this one, Christy. Um, in terms of other strategies, first of all, I would recommend just don't use screens as a self-soother. You might need to use them as a timeout for parents so that you can go to the toilet or have a shower on your own. But, but in terms of self-soothing, I'd be looking at anything and everything as an alternative. If you want to use the device because there are just some great apps that are available, uh, you, I'd be focusing more on music. I'd be focusing on white noise. I'd be focusing on those progressive muscle relaxation kinds of apps. If that's the pathway you want to go, there's Headspace for Mindfulness. There's the Calm app. Those kinds of things are really great. But I think the most soothing things that we can do are actually connect, lay down together, read stories, hold, touch, hug, uh, lay on the trampoline and look at the stars or look at the sky and the clouds. Uh, those are the directions that I'd be going. Christy, what would you add? I'd echo those sentiments. Um, I would say try to connect. Um, if we use it as a self-soother, it can become um, very obsessive for our kids. And what sometimes looks to be a calming um, mechanism because they appear like the digital zombie can actually overstimulate them. So a lot of families find that it actually backfires. I'd also add to the music and the mindfulness apps that you suggested. Um, there are some brilliant um, meditation and mindfulness apps specifically designed for kids. So if your kids like to use devices to calm down, then targeting that towards appropriate content, um, kindling, have a great range um, of, of um, apps for children or sorry for mindfulness um, meditations etc and I'd also suggest um, if they want to calm down sometimes audio works a lot better um, so finding music that uh, imitates the resting heartbeat so about 60 to 80 beats per minute can help them to calm down um, as can listening to podcasts and audio books um, in lieu of sort of the rapid fire screen use but I would still recommend try to just connect and, yeah. and turn off the screens as much as you can. Uh, um, Kelly has said, can you please point me in the direction of what you consider good bullying resources? So I'm not aware of any good bullying. Uh, most bullying is considered bad bullying. Um, and if you're looking for bullying resources, I'd rather you look for anti-bullying resources. I'm sorry, I'm being cheeky, Kelly. I'm so sorry. I couldn't help myself. Um, the the eSafety Commissioner for Online um, anti-bullying content is amazing. Uh, there's also a guy over in the United States called Justin Patchen, and he's at the University of Wisconsin, and he runs um, a cyberbullying website. I can't remember what it's called. I think it's cyberbullying.org or something like that. Uh, they're brilliant. Christy, any, any anti-bullying? Uh, uh I love um, Rachel from Stymie here in Australia. Um, Rachel developed an online um, cyberbullying um, yes. anonymous reporting tool. And Rachel um, Stymie spelled S-T-Y-M-I-E, um, based in Queensland. She actually won um, Queenslander of the Year Award recently. Um, so highly recommend her work. Yeah, nice one. And also the Alana and Madeline Foundation uh, have some really great stuff there. Um, and they're, they're, they're very, very good. I, I actually used to speak at their conferences about bullying and I can't remember what it's called. Uh, Evelyn has just printed up, uh, so, uh, sorry, added cyberbullying.org. That's Justin Patchen's one uh, over in the United States, cyberbullying.org. Very, very good evidence-based, brilliant stuff. Uh, next one, how to navigate the peer pressure from other students and friends when my child's not allowed to play the video games or social media apps or apps like TikTok. We've kind of addressed this 
And I think that it's really that explore, explain, empower sort of stuff. And you know what? I, I just, I say to parents and I say this to my own kids, you let your kids know every family's got different rules and it's going to seem like our rules are horrible. And there are going to be times where you're going to be really cranky at us for our rules, but they're the rules that we think are most important for you to make safe, healthy decisions. And that's what our decision is. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm on the same page with you there. I think that's good advice. Okay. Um, oh, and I just accidentally went uh, and pushed the wrong button there. Uh, is another room with adult, sorry, is, an, is having your children in another room without adult supervision different to having them on a device in a bedroom? I feel like my 11 year old can have some privacy chatting to friends, which is often in her bedroom. Can I just send her to another room rather than having her in her bedroom? Um, I'll, I'll jump in here. I think um, we definitely want to keep all tech out of bedrooms. Um, not only does it have negative impacts on sleep associations um, and on the quality and quantity of their sleep, but it obviously increases cyber safety risks. Um, what I do say to parents is keep technology in publicly accessible spots in the house. Um, your child is very unlikely to be sending nudes while they're sitting next to you or laying with you on the lounge or sitting with you in the kitchen. Much more well, likely to be know. doing it. Yeah. <laughs> True. Um, when they're in close proximity. So have devices in places where you can walk past and access. Um, and ideally, that would be out of bedrooms where possible. Okay, we're just going to do three more questions. And then we're going to wrap things up. This one's a really good one. How do I best deal with the social impacts around screen time? When so many of my children's peers seem to have almost unlimited access to screens? And you as a parent may say, just one hour per day for gaming. No one wants their child to be left out or picked on because they're not interacting with their peer group in that way. However, at the same time, how can hours upon hours a day in front of a screen be okay? And we've kind of addressed this in a few ways, but I wonder if there's anything else that you want to add, Christy? Um, nothing really springs to mind. Um, I think, again, giving them reasons for your, justi justifying your reasons, um, I think helps them to appreciate why you're doing it. Um, getting your child's buy-in, often we underestimate their insight. So asking them, as you suggested with your example with your daughter, when she was asking for um, her app of choice, um, getting them to articulate because you might be able to find other avenues that you can meet their needs. Um, and I also think um, where you can, try to foster and forge relationships with even if it's just one or two of their other peers whose parents have similar screen time rules to what you do um, can really help you feel less like the, the bad guy um, would be my general advice there. <laughs> you, you, you've taken, you, you literally one by one, you ticked off everything that I was going to say. So that's great. Let's, let's move on. Uh, so, so we've still got this question coming up screen time limits by age from toddlers and up to young teens. Now, I feel like we've addressed this really quite well at the beginning, but I wanna be really, really explicit. Screen time limits are important only to the extent that they're displacing other important activities and relationships. TV, iPad, telephone, laptop, desktop, it doesn't matter what the screen is, if it's stopping our kids being active, being in nature, connecting with us as people or with their friends as people, uh, being involved in other kinds of gross motor and fine motor development skills, playing the piano or the violin or whatever musical instrument or playing soccer or netball, whatever it is. We want our children to be, we're, we're, we've got to be less interested in how much and more, in, more interested in what kind and what else they could be doing. But if they've done all the stuff, like you know, the stuff that's on page 160 of my book, 10 Things Every Parent Needs to Know, if they've done all that stuff, I don't think that it's a big deal. Uh, Christy, I, I mean, well, the one thing that I would say is we can be a lot more lenient with high levels of screen time with older kids than younger kids. I think we want to be more protective of our younger ch child's brains, uh, but the same principles still apply. Absolutely. Um, look, I think we need to be very vigilant. I, my recommendation is that we need to really restrict and limit children's screen time use in those first three years of life, given that we know about 85% of brain development happens in those early years. And also the fact that 
kids in those early years often need much more sleep and that physical movement um, and play is absolutely vital for the development and well-being. So I think in those first three years, having very stringent limitations, um, I think the reality is whether we love it or loathe that technology is an integral part of our kids' lives. So I think we need to get them to use it, but to use it in ways that doesn't encroach on their basic needs, as you said, Justin. Okay, well, there's one last question, and this one's a bit of a tricky one, and we'll wrap up with this one. Thank you so much, by the way, to everyone for staying online as we've wrapped this up. We've gone literally double the amount of time that we said we would, but I feel like it's been a really impactful and really valuable hour and a half. So I'm, I, I don't mind that we've been you know, worked double, t double time. That's, it's, it's been great to be with you all. The last question is this. A couple of people have asked about children with ADHD or kids on the autism spectrum being aggressive and not wanting to come off screens and what we do when children have special or additional needs. Now, we have addressed this briefly, but Christy, is there anything else that you would normally add around children who have these needs that are uh, not necessarily neurotypical? Um, I think I would allude to what you were talking about before, and that is that sometimes screen time, as in your children's screen time, especially if you have children with additional needs, can be more beneficial for you as a parent. Um, I, I know parents with children with additional needs. Um, it can be mentally, um, emotionally depleting and exhausting at times. So if having giving them some screen time is going to give you some time to recuperate, it's going to give you um, some time to invest in your mental well-being to draw breath um, and to, to go back in and help your children I think that, that 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 can be a good coping mechanism for us as adults as much as it can be but again being mindful of what we give them at that time because we don't want to exacerbate the situation um, or make things even more pronounced so select wisely you know using some of those apps that we talked about before yeah yeah I, I would also just say that even if your child has ADHD or is on the spectrum those ideas around exploring, explaining and empowering become even more important. It's harder to do it. It takes more effort and you will have lots and lots of slip ups and a lot of backsliding. But what I've found, and there's a great quote from a guy called Stephen Covey, who many of you might be familiar with. He said, fast is slow and slow is fast. I think if we remember that if we do it the slow, painstaking, bit by bit kind of way, we will get better results in the long term and it will be worth it to put in the effort, even though it seems really hard. In fact, that's probably a nice way to wrap up with all of this conversation. When we're dealing with our children, fast is slow, slow is fast. Take your time, nurture the relationship, work on building a foundation of trust and helping your children to understand why these things matter so much. I think that's something that we've really underscored throughout this presentation, Christy. And, uh, and hopefully that will help you to help them to be empowered to make great decisions themselves. Any last words? No, I think I commend anyone who's still here watching live or watching the replay to the very end. I think you get bonus points. Um, a huge thanks to the team at Parenting South Australia um, for hosting um, the event and to Justin's team, um, particularly Evelyn, um, who has worked tirelessly in the back end, helping to organise and coordinate all the logistics of this evening. Um, I'm hoping you feel as, as parents and, and perhaps educators and health professionals um, better equipped to navigate this digital um, terrain um, given that we now realise, I think, if anything we have discovered through this pandemic is that technology plays a pivotal role in our lives and we really want to leverage the benefits and the affordances that it offers and try as best we can to mitigate those pitfalls. So hopefully this evening's webinar has empowered you um, to make more educated and informed um, decisions in this space without the, the guilt and grief that often comes with raising screen ages. Christy, so well said. Thank you for, for sharing that. To all of you who are still with us and are sending through those very kind words of gratitude through the Zoom webinar chat, we appreciate that. We so much appreciate that you've been with us. Uh, now, uh, I, I would only echo what Christy said and say thank you again, uh, especially to Parenting SA. And um, turn off the computer right now and... <laughs> Go and hug your kids, okay? I think that's the most important thing you can do right now. Thanks so much and have a great night.